Good morning and a warm welcome to McLean Presbyterian Church. It's really good to see you here this morning. It's amazing, despite the weather that we've had, that, that so many of you have, have been able to get here this morning, and we're just we're, we're, we're glad to have you with us today. So I may have made my wife and my assistant pastor show up together this morning. But we are glad to be here. We have a couple of announcements that we want to make. Uh, also behind the camera is Christy Danner. Christy, say hello. 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 Very good. Um, we hate that we have to cancel church. We really do. Uh, because we, we enjoy being together and we enjoy being with this, with this church family. It's uh, in many ways a, a highlight for the week and, and fuel for the worship life. Uh, of, of the week. If you're watching this, hopefully you have power. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed some time with family and friends. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed some time maybe with some neighbors, some neighbors too, you know, in, in our town where we uh, try not even to make eye contact with our neighbors. The weather gives us an opportunity to love them and to, to love them well. Uh, so hope you uh, get them, make the most of that if you get the, get the opportunity. Um, we have a few announcements uh, just to, to touch base on really quickly, and David is going to hit us with those. So, David, what's up? So, three quick announcements. The first, if you have any needs, our deacons stand ready to help. There is some contact information in the email that we sent. Second, we are moving our congregational meeting to next week following the third worship service. It'll be at 1245. And then finally, we put together a family or individual worship guide to help you out this morning, some questions, some readings. And so James is actually going to talk a little bit about what's coming up in the sermon and how it relates to these questions uh, to guide you in the few moments that you might spend with the Lord this morning or with your family. Yeah, so we can't be together for worship, but we still wanted to worship. And had we been together this morning, we'd be starting a new series, a new series called Grasping for Grace, the Gospel According to Jacob. It's going to be a series on the life of Jacob, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We've got some fun topics coming up. Here, here's a few of them. Uh, we're going to talk about a fight that took place in the womb. We're going to talk about a hairy man with ginger hair. Um, not James. Not me. Not Harry. <laughs> not yet. Uh, we're going to talk about a wild hunter and a mama's boy. We're going to talk about a stairway to heaven. We're going to do a sermon that, that could be an episode of Sister Wives. And we're also going to talk about the greatest of all the rumbles in the jungle. Now, the, the point of this sermon series is that Jacob started to wrestle in the womb, literally. He started to wrestle with his brother in the womb and from that point on his life was marked by by striving by toiling by by fighting as he he looked for something that would satisfy his soul now he doesn't find that thing until the very end of the story and of course it doesn't come through any of the things that he's looked to throughout his journey but comes in the grace of god and the story teaches us a lot about the pursuit of satisfaction and how that can only be found in the grace of God, how we look for, for happiness, for purpose, for meaning in a whole host of areas, only to discover that in the gospel, we already had them to begin with. So in some ways, this sermon series is actually part two of the sermon series we did in the fall. Remember in the fall, we did our labeled series where we crawled ever so slowly through those first few verses of First Peter. And the theme then was, was identity, thinking about how our identity is found in Christ. Well, Jacob's life is like a picture or a story or an illustration that uh, unpacks those truths that we've reflect upon to, reflected upon together in the fall. So through this series, we'll hopefully bring to life some more of those, uh, some, some, some of those ideas and, and also apply them to our own lives in a new way. And in a moment, we'll actually cut to the first series, uh, the first sermon in that series. You can watch it, and then you can ask some of the questions that we've provided and discuss them with your family. If your children have a hard time listening to the sermon or paying attention, then we have some alternative uh, readings that you can use, uh, as well as some discussion questions uh, to follow up. But we hope this is helpful for you, and we hope that this is just a blessed time with your family. Yeah. So, well... Listen to the sermon that follows, check out the attachment uh, on this email, uh, be well, uh, be warm, and know your pastors love you. We'll see you next week. Let's pray together.
Father in heaven, by the power of your spirit, we come to Jesus, who waits patiently for us, who isn't frustrated, but but waits patiently for us to come, gently calling us to come, bidding us to come and find freedom, to taste and see the goodness of the gospel in your arms of grace. Father, only this, only this can carry our burdens away. And we pray that that would be our experience, that that gospel reality would be our experience now as we spend time together reflecting on your word. In the perfect name of Jesus, amen. Please. So our text for the morning is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Sermon title this morning, What's in a Name? Uh, several months ago now, Rosie and I were out for dinner. We had, we had date night and we were eating at a restaurant out in Reston where we live and we'd uh, enjoyed a meal together and we were enjoying good conversation. And then one of the wait staff came over and he said to me, Are you James Forsyth? And it was strange because I suddenly felt like nervous and like weirdly a little guilty. You know, I was just kind of like, what does he know, right? And he said, I'm James Forsyth. And I was like, we have the same name. This is excellent. And he's like a kind of jacked, dark, handsome guy with great facial hair. And I was like, I'm going to grow up and be you, right? (laughs) Now, my full name is actually James William Forsyth. That's the name my parents give me. See, on the front of the bulletin every week, it says the Reverend James W. Forsyth. That stands for James William. About 10 miles off the northernmost point of Scotland, there's a wee cluster of isles that are collectively known as the Orkney Islands. And as you sail your way over to what's a very rugged coast, you sway back and forth and up and down as the waves are stirred by an ever-present wind. You step ashore and the waves stop, but the wind doesn't. So you zip up your coat and you kind of huddle your way to the nearest building. Once inside, you're able to look out through what are always rain-speckled windows to see a landscape that really is beautiful. The classic rolling green hills, but also golden barley fields and inland lochs and wildflower meadows and heather-covered moors. It's It's a beautiful place. Now, the islands have been inhabited for for thousands of years. In fact, you can go and tour one settlement called Scarabray, which has actually been dated to 3000 BC. That's older than the pyramid. that's, That's older than Moses. And there on these islands, some 5,000 years later, is where my grandfather lived. My great grandfather lived. He lived in a wee home that was called the Burn after the the wee river that flowed in the pasture in front of his house. And he was a big man with really extraordinary hands. He worked his whole life as a stonemason. And these hands are the hands that that built the burn. And these hands are the hands that that carried Mary across the threshold. And these hands are the hands that welcomed four wee kids into the world. Two boys, two girls. By the time we went to visit, he lived alone. He outlived Mary, and sadly, he outlived his two sons as well. One died at just 17 years old in a motorcycle accident. The other died later in life from from a rare brain tumor. But even then, when we went to visit, these hands were still busy. He'd collect driftwood blown in by that incredibly turbulent sea, and he'd carve and and whittle it into miniature furniture. I remember he gave two particularly noble chairs to my parents as a wedding gift that sat as an ornament in our home. With these hands, he would fashion the most amazing and remarkable kites that would fly like no other in the blustery Orkney wind, much to the delight of all the kids who would gather around him. With these big hands, he was also able to play the fiddle by an open fire as the day drew near. I'll never forget, he used to have a, a, a friend who would come over, and the two of them would play the fiddle together, then take a nap, right? <laughs> and it's like, that's such an awesome old man activity, you know? 
As kids, we loved being there. I remember roaming around outside epic games of hide and seek in the tall grass. I remember sitting on this old rusty tractor that sat on his property. It came alive in, in our imaginations. I remember playing by and indeed falling in the burn. Generations of my family have been fished out of that wee stream. <laughs> and we loved, we loved him. We called him Grandpa. What, what was strange was that everyone called him Grandpa. Like we called him Grandpa, but my parents called him Grandpa, and even my grandparents called him Grandpa. It was kind of just the name by which he was known. It was almost as if the very essence of Grandpa lived within his soul. We called him Grandpa. But his name was James William. To me, he was older than the pyramids. To me, he was older than Moses. But he gave me precious memories, and he gave me a name. I remember I'd arrive at his house, and with great joy and enthusiasm in his voice, he'd say, aye, now there's two Jimmy Willies in this house. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the affection of that call is kindled in me, even as I tell, tell the story. What's your name? Where did you get your name from? Do you know? If you're able, ask your parents why they named you as they did. If you're named after someone who's still alive, call them today <laughs> while you still can. Unfortunately, the names we receive at birth are not the only names that we receive throughout our lives. A few kids make it off the playground without being labeled a thing or two, and none of us make it into adulthood without adding a few labels of our own. Names that are never as positive as the names our parents gave us, yet names that do have a, a controlling and powerful impact over our identity. Names that have a controlling and powerful impact on the very lives that we lead. Some examples. The name that she gave herself was ugly. Born with a birthmark that covered half her face, she was just eight years old, the first day of third grade when the kids laughed at her appearance. In fourth grade, she started to stay inside during recess because outside was worse. In fifth grade, she moved to the back of the class to avoid the spitballs. In sixth grade, they attached a note to her desk that said, beware of dog. The year after, one of the kids said that her face looked like a wrong answer that someone had tried to erase. And so, is it any wonder? Is it any wonder that she gave herself this name and that she still feels ugly? She feels ugly though 20 years have passed and she has a husband who loves her dearly. She feels ugly even though she has two wee girls whose very definition of beautiful begins with her. Names, a controlling impact on our identity, a controlling impact on our lives. Does her story resonate with yours? Ugly, fat, unlovable. Perhaps not. The name he gave himself was, was average, mediocre. Never the biggest, never the strongest, never the smartest. A childhood lived under a vague veil of parental disapproval. Always near last to be picked in the making of teams. A career as smooth as that awkward child who stands alone at the high school dance. When he dared to have hopes, when he dared to have dreams, they were never realized, they were never kissed. And so, is it any wonder that to this day, though 20 years have passed, that he still feels average. He still feels mediocre. He still feels that he has nothing to offer. Perhaps his story resonates with yours. Disappointing, overlooked, not having what it takes. Names that have a powerful impact on our identity, on our lives. Personally, the name that I gave myself was the name Failure. Growing up in a context where success and achievement and excellence were always 
the lowest bar that you were expected to maintain. That played out in a thousand ways from sports to academics to relationships. Is it any wonder that now I still have a hard time celebrating when things go really well? When things go really well, you're more likely to find me exhaling with relief that they didn't go badly, <laughs> right? Perhaps my story resonates with yours. Names that control your identity, names that control the kind of life that you live. Feeling this pressure to achieve, fearing failure. Feeling that you've got to prove yourself. Well, what does God have to say about names? What does he have to say about these names? He has something <laughs> excellent to say about these names. Here's what he says. 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, <laughs> perhaps you're thinking, well, that's a little underwhelming. I was looking for something a, a little more than that. Why are those words so powerful? Well, let's remind ourselves of his story because his story, story really provides the, the dynamite that makes this verse explode. Remember that, that Peter was not his original name. When he was born, that's not the name his parents give him. Do you remember? At first, his name was Simon. When he shows up in the first pages of Scripture, in John chapter 1, that's his given name. That's what he's known by. That's the name his parents gave him. Simon comes from a verb. The word Simon comes from a verb that means to listen with the intent to obey. To listen with the intent to obey. So, on one hand, it's a great name. But on the other hand, if you know anything about Simon, it's a very inappropriate name. <laughs> Listen with the intent to obey. He's the guy who acts without even thinking. If there's a Greek word that means that, that's what his name is. Acts without even thinking. He's the guy, remember his genius in Mark chapter 8, when he rebukes Jesus for, for saying that he was going to go to the cross. Yeah, good, thanks, Simon. That's a good idea. Let's try halt the salvation of the entire world. Right? <laughs> or in John chapter 13, when he refuses to let Jesus wash his feet. And you're like, you really don't understand how this gospel thing works. Or Mark chapter 9, Peter's the guy, oh man. You know when there's silence, and silence can be awkward, so there's always one person who'll just say something stupid so there's not silence anymore? <laughs> Read Mark chapter 9 this afternoon. That's what Peter does. But worst of all, worst of all, his most defining sin, Peter is the one who denies Jesus three times. In, in the kind of pomp of his character, he had said, I will never leave you, Jesus. He said, though everyone else leaves you, I will never leave you. In fact, even to the point of death. And then when the moment came, he denied him, not once, not twice, but three times. Denied he ever knew the one he swore he'd die for. And so we see that Peter was not his original name. An apostle was not his original identity. He's not Peter the apostle. He's Simon the denier. What a great example he is for us of how our identity impacts the kind of life that we lead. Do you remember in John chapter 21 where we read of Simon being so ashamed of the fact that he's become the denier, so caught up in his, in his guilt and his humiliation that he goes back to being a fisherman, goes back to the work that he did before he ever met Jesus. So his, his time with Jesus, his years with Jesus have been filled with so much hope and so much potential and so much promise, but he had now proved himself so unworthy of being involved in such a cause. And so he puts himself on the sidelines. He puts himself on the scrap heap. He puts himself, he disqualifies himself as, as useless to the cause of Christ. Are you starting to see why this adds some dynamite to our verse here? What should Peter 1.1 say? What should the book be called? How should he self-identify? 
First, let's open our Bibles to 1 Simon 1, 1. Simon, the denier of Jesus Christ. Right? But what do we get? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. What's happened here? How did we go from, from Simon to Peter, from denier to apostle? Answer, Jesus loved him and it changed everything. His name, his identity, his life. It starts with his name. In John chapter one, Jesus appears and he says, time for a name change. Your name has been Simon, but from now on you shall be called Peter, which means rock. And Peter must mean like, sweet, that is an awesome name, call me rock, right? And Jesus says to him, you've, you've not been Simon. You've not listened with the intent to obey, but still you will be the rock on which I build my church. Why? Because all is grace and I love you. And after changing his name, he then changes his identity. It's so powerful when Jesus shows up in John chapter 21. Powerful because this is after the crucifixion. It's after the resurrection. It's after Peter has denied Jesus three times. Jesus shows up and he says, I'm not just giving you a new name. I'm giving you a new identity too. So you have put yourself on the sidelines, but I'm putting you back in the game. And you have put yourself on the scrap heap, but I'm reclaiming you as precious. And you have disqualified yourself as useless, but I am recommissioning you for usefulness in the kingdom. So feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. Jesus showed up and loves Simon the denier. Into Peter the Apostle. And it changed his life forever. Experiencing the love of God in Christ, all of grace, experiencing the love of God in Christ. Peter leaves his nets and becomes a fisher of men. Experiencing the love of God in Christ, Peter engages in the work of Christ and lives a life of full, bold joy, a disciple who makes a difference in the kingdom, all because he met the love of Christ. Now, I can't help wonder this morning, when I see what the love of Christ did in his life, how it changed Simon the Denier into Peter the Apostle, I can't help but wonder what that same love might, might do in me. And what that same love might do in you. And what that same love might do in our community. Because we know that the love of Christ, that the name-changing, identity-changing, life-changing love of Christ is uh, available and offered to us today. The only problem is, I think the problem is we don't believe it. If you describe yourself as a Christian, of course there's one level in which you would say, yeah, God loves me. But there's a, another sense in which that, that reality is a fleeting experience. We know God loves us, but it doesn't have functional control over our lives. His love doesn't have a functional control over our identities, functional control over the decisions that we make. We know that he loves us, but we find it hard to live in an ongoing awareness of the pleasure he takes in us. As shadows shift or as echoes fade, so the love of God quickly slips through our fingers. We know that he loves us, we forget. We believe that he loves us, then we doubt. We're confident, then we're insecure. All in the space of a morning. We are a people who find it hard to hold on to the love of Christ. Brendan Manning used to say, friends, this morning, let me ask you, do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God loves you just as you are and not as you should be? Because none of us in this church is as we should be. 
Do you believe that God's love goes beyond your ugliness, beyond your mediocrity, beyond your failure? Do you believe that God loves you? Not that he loves the person next to you. Easy to believe that. Not that he loves the holy people, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa. Easy to believe that. Not that he loves the church in a general sense. That's easy to believe too. Not that he even loves the whole human race in some vague sort of way. That's easy to believe. Do you believe that God loves you? He loves you in such a way that he'd rather die than be without you. When you listen to the love of God, God looks down deep into our hearts. Past the ugliness, past the mediocrity, past, you know, the failure. But also past all the the sin and the shame and the guilt. And past all of our confusion and all of our uncertainty and all of our fear. And as God looks into your soul this morning, he sees a name that he himself inscribed. Beloved in Jesus Christ. And as you lift your eyes, you see your own name engraved on the palms of his hands. Do you believe that God loves you this morning? Because imagine, imagine we did. (laughs) Not in the kind of Sunday school right answer way, but in a captivating, controlling, life-altering way. Imagine we were a people who lived in the present awareness of the deep pleasure he takes in us. Imagine you woke up and walked with Jesus in the morning, and you were aware of his love. You know, Jesus is looking over your shoulder. How do you feel about the number you see on your scale? I think you care a lot less. You walk with Jesus in in the morning, and, you know, are there there people you're just going to, you know, no longer try to so hard to please as you walk with Jesus in the morning are there going to be other people you find it easier to love and into the afternoon you keep on walking with Jesus with an awareness of his love and his his presence with you you show up for your 1pm and there he is is that going to change how you feel about success that day is that going to change the the pride you feel when things go well or the insecurity you feel when things go poorly If Jesus walks with you in the afternoon and you live in this awareness of his love, are you going to tackle the day with more joy? Are you going to take risks that you'd have been too afraid to otherwise? And when you get home in the evening, you sit down and Jesus is still there and you're still aware of his love. Are you going to worry a little less? Are you going to reorder some priorities? Are you going to find you sleep with complete peace of mind? Peter experienced the love of God in Christ and it changed his name and it changed his identity and it changed his life. And that's what happens when you live with that active awareness of the love of God for your soul. So the question as we start this series is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. Sermon in a sentence. You ready? God loves you. Right now, in this very moment. Let's pray. Father, we find your love elusive. Though it is constant, though it is steady, our awareness of it is so fluctuating. Partly because of our sin, we live in rebellion against you and we think, you know, how could anyone ever love us as we really are? Partly because of our our brokenness, the labels we've been given in our lives that make it hard for us to believe that we really are valuable to us. And yet, Lord, you are the one who takes Simon the denier and makes him Peter the apostle, showering him with love, with grace. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who know your love in a way that's, that's deeper than head knowledge know your love deep down uh, to the core. And we take a few moments just now, Lord, to, to bring ourselves into your presence, into the presence of the one who's, who's bid us to come, and be reminded of your love.